Hey guys, it's Sunday, you made it. We just wanna thank you for joining us here. We got a great message in store for you. I just wanna take this moment to quickly thank you for partnering with us, for continuing to give, being faithful to that cause. Uh, even though we're meeting digitally, we just wanna ask that you, if it's in your heart, continue to give with us because though we're meeting outside of church, we haven't given up any ground, we haven't stopped moving forward. There's a lot of things to come. So uh, stay connected with us, whether it's social media, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, whatever, we're on all platforms. So stay with us. We got a great message here for you. Thanks. Hey everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. This has been a crazy experience. And I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for being a part of the journey. Thank you for giving. Thank you for tuning into Zoom, into Instagram, into YouTube. And as we continue this conversation and this talk on the book of James, we are now in chapter three and a little bit of chapter four. So before we even move forward, stop what you're doing. If you have not read chapter three, pause. Pause right now. Read chapter three, a little bit of chapter four. Chapter four, end at verse 16. And we're gonna kind of read this together. We're gonna examine this together. And remember, I'm not going verse by verse, but I am going chapter by chapter. And so today, um, there's a story I wanna share before we jump in. I don't know if you could think back to high school. There's like drama, there's issues. If you know anything about my story, you know that. And even today, like I wish, and really I'm kind of sitting on the other side of the camera as well, taking this in because this is a type of message James has na James has like slapped me in the face and he said, hey, you need to wake up to the reality that your tongue has a lot of rep, rep it messes you up, your tongue. And so this is what we're going to talk about. Uh, when I was in high school, there were two incidences that really shaped, um, my perspective on like, man, you probably are speaking out of turn. So I'll never forget, there was this rumor going around about me about my sophomore year. And I had preconceived thoughts about how I was gonna get this person back. This person had spread so much rumor about me. And if you knew anything about my story, like wherever I was, drama went. And I was like the drama magnet. So I'll never forget, um, so, like, it was lunchtime in the quad at Chino High School and I decided to do it during lunch so everyone could hear. And I'll never forget, I walked up to this individual and th this person was saying things about me that wasn't true. And so I decided amidst everyone else to directly but yet indirectly share how they had a rumor or they had something they had done wrong and I put them on blast. And I'll never forget the words that I said, the the disrespect that I brought and, on, and it just, it blew up. And from that point on, more drama came. From that point on, more disorder came. From that point on, there was just a, a ripple effect of drama in my life. Another incident of where my tongue just kind of got the best of me, uh, I had a Volkswagen, same year, sophomore year, I had a Volkswagen and it was slammed to the ground. It was super loud and again, it was a cop magnet. And uh, there were multiple times I already had some, some issues with the police in this vehicle. And I was 16 years old. I had just gotten my, my license. And there were two friends in the car. Many of you probably even know them. Lauren and Brittany. They were in the car. They were just really good friends of mine. And I remember we were going like ice blocking. So we went and bought ice. I thought I was like super cool because I could drive. And we had the ice in the back of the, 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 the Volkswagen. And we were driving down the street and a police officer pulled me over. I knew I wasn't speeding. I knew I had done nothing wrong with the law. I put my blinkers on, I was going the right speed. And the police officer pulled me over and I was already bothered. I was already frustrated and I already knew that what I was gonna say because I was so bothered by like me getting pulled over because again, this had happened multiple times. The police officer said, do you know why I pulled you over? And I was like, no, I have no idea. I wasn't speeding, I wasn't doing anything wrong. He said, well, that little, that placard that's hanging on your mirror, about a size of an index card, that's distracting you while you're driving. And I remember I looked at him, kind of chuckled, and I was like, this small little placard is gonna get in the way of me driving? Like, it's, it's not. And I'll never forget, then I find myself out of the car, sitting on the sidewalk, my two friends are sitting there with me, and the police officer, because I was 16 years old, and at this time you have a six month like grace period where you can't drive with anyone. And the police officer looks at me, he gets my license, and he says, I want you to read this to me, the back of it. And I looked at him, and again, my tongue got the best of me, and I said, I'm not reading it, I know exactly what it says. And of course, there was just all this drama that came from it. 
I only I share those stories to say this. There have been so many times in my life where my tongue got the best of me. My words really messed me up. Did you know this? Words can change everything. The right combination of words can separate a marriage. The right combination of words can split up business partners. The things that you choose to say can literally set a house on fire. The right words or the wrong words or temperament, it can ruin or terminate a relationship and also really can truly affect your future. And here it is, James is trying to compel us in chapter three and a little bit of chapter four. He's trying to exhort to us and he's trying to express to us with all the passion in him that the words that we say really do have an effect in our future. So here's a big overview, James chapter one. He hits this one verse and in the end he says, if you have a relationship, or really he says, if, if your religion, in our context would be a relationship, if you have a relationship with God, you can't tame your tongue, and you can't tame your tongue, your whole relationship with Jesus, he says, is worthless. So like, turn there right now, James chapter one, it's actually verse 26, it says, those who consider themselves religious, or again, in relationship with God, and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves. And then he goes on to say, and their religion or relationship is worthless. And that's like a slap in my face. Okay, so if the words that I'm saying, the ramifications of it, if I'm not speaking in the right tone, if I'm not thinking about what I'm saying, and it's all really bad, he goes as far to say, your relationship with Jesus is worthless. And that's like a pretty big, heavy thing for me. So chapter two, he then goes on, he says, what does it look like to actually have faith that works? And then chapter three, he now unpacks what he started to unpack in chapter one. And it's basically, what would it look like to tame your tongue? You see, in the church, in this moment, there are two big issues going on. The first, a lot of people have the talk without the walk. They're like walking around and they're like on Instagram and they're like, hey, like check me out. Uh, I'm, I'm on my Zoom. I'm, I'm like giving a word of encouraged people. And they're saying all this stuff, but they're not really walking it out. And James has an issue with it. P another point is... Someone obviously in the community, in James's life, in James, in the church in Jerusalem, somebody had the talk that was literally tearing the church apart. So James now focuses on what we're saying, how we're saying it, and how it really shows a direct correlation to our heart. So it says, that, so this is what's crazy, and I love this because the Holy Spirit knew that this was for Coin Church today. Like this is for us right here, right now in the 21st century. James chapter three. He hits on this. He says, the tongue is tiny, but the power of it is titanic. The reason I, I use the word titanic is if you look at it, he actually says in chapter three, he goes on to talk about how uh, our, our mouths, you know, and you can control a horse by its mouth. And then he says, you can control, we control animals. We can kind of have control over them. But then he goes on to say, you look at a ship. And I think of like the Titanic because it's so big, it's so massive, like really almost three soccer fields long, multiple flights high. And he says, what's crazy about this ship, what's crazy about a ship is however big it is, it's controlled by a small little piece that controls the ship. He says to change, and it's important, it's because it can change the direction of your entire life. It's a rudder, that's what it is. Another point of your tongue and how it, the power of it is titanic is also the tongue is tiny but has titanic power to destroy. So it can actually help your future or it can destroy your future. Your tongue can actually help you get into rooms that you've never been able to get into because of how articulate you were, of how wise you were, or it can literally shut the door on so many things. He goes as far as to say it's like a little spark starting a huge fire. The mouth makes the sound, here it is, I'm preaching right now. The mouth makes the sound, but the heart is the source. If you're taking notes, please write that down. It's like just as important for you as it is for me. The mouth makes the sound. We have frequencies that we're using, different language that we, it doesn't matter what language you're speaking, you're using words to articulate something important to you. But let's not get it uh, twisted, let's not get confused about it. The source to which you're speaking comes from the heart. And that's what James is talking about. You see, we could talk all the rest of this time about how important is what you're saying, how important is what you shouldn't say. But really, the matter of it is, if we're not talking about your heart, we're gonna miss the big picture. 
So James 3 verse 9 says this, with the tongue we praise the Lord. We go to church, we raise our hands, we're in our car, we're praising, we're doing good. And then literally with that same tongue, we curse other people who have been made in God's image. And then you go on to verse 3 of chapter 9, uh, chapter James 3, chapter 11, verse 11, he says, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? James 3, 13, he says, who is wise in understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by the way they, they walk, by also the deeds done. And here's like this main word that I want to hit on for the remainder of our time. It's this word humility. Just say it out loud right now with me, humility, right? Humility is so important. If we get humility wrong, it will, it will bring so much destruction because I would argue the antithesis of humility obviously is pride. And James would say pride is a big source of the things that you say and how it can destroy your life. Humility that comes from wisdom. So humility is a big deal. It's a big deal for the today. It's a big deal for this message. And I wrote this down if you're taking notes. If you're someone who struggles with the words that come out of your mouth, it's an issue of pride. Sorry to break it to you, this is for me too. If you're someone who struggles with the words of your mouth, it's an issue of pride, which how can it be fixed? By the Spirit of God giving you humility. So in order to fix pride, you have to insert in your life, in your being, not just with your words, but with your heart, the true nature of humility. We've all said this at one point in time, I have at least. Man, I wish I didn't say that. I wish, like, I remember when I was uh, in elementary school, when I was a young little boy, a young buck, I would argue with my mom, I would argue with my brother, I would argue with my dad, and I'll, like, m in their face, I'd say, I hate you, and then I'd run to my door, and as I shut the door, I was like, I'd say it aloud, why did I say that? Like, that's not true. When I was younger, I would immediately go and apologize. I really would because I felt so bad. And then as I got older, the pride, again, pride got in the way and it would take a little longer and I'd go up to my mom, mom, I really don't know why I said that. That's, not, I don't hate you, mom, I love you. But that's what happens when you allow all this stuff to get in the way. It can really mess up relationships. Have you said this though? I, I don't know why I said that. Has that ever been you? Or, or why did I say that? I didn't even need to say that. There's so many times we say things, myself included, that we don't need to say. Like we can just be quiet about. But again, it detours and it like really shapes our future. And it goes back to this. It's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. I want, I want, I don't know if you're, you're this person. But there's a lot of people that are out there like this. You want to like top everything or everyone. So for example, I, I like my Volkswagen, right? I come to school and I'm like, guys, check out my bug. Like, it's so cool, it's loud. It's got a 12 inch sub in the back. It's like really cool. And then there's like a topper. This is like an analogy, it just didn't really happen. And there's a topper that comes and he's like, dude, that's so cool you got that. Like, I'm getting a BMW next week. And there's always like that, like one topper that always wants to just one up you on everything, one up you on all this stuff. And th that's an issue of pride, right? There's also those that just want to gossip. So it looks like they like are very special and people are coming to them. And that is another form. Like we say things so out of turn where we really don't need to say, but it's a, it's a direct correlation of maybe pride, maybe some envy, maybe some things that you want people to see. No, like I'm good, I'm special, people come to me, but yet it's so important that we kind of tame our tongue and James is just going right at the heart issue. Why do we tear people down? Why does everything we do or everything I do have to be better than what you do? Why do I have to say the things I say? These should be questions we're asking. And James then is saying, it's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. So it says this in verse 13 of chapter three, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show, show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility. There it is, humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor, harbor, if you let it boil up, if you let it kind of sit and, 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 and marinate and meet up, if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth, be honest. He says, such wisdom, quote unquote, wisdom does not come from heaven, but it's earthly, it's unspiritual, and it's demonic. Such wisdom, what does he mean? Such wisdom, the, the, the world's wisdom is earthly, it's unspiritual, and eventually it becomes of the devil. 
Verse 16, he says, For where you have envy and self-ambition, all direct correlations of pride, where you have such things, there you find disorder and every evil practice. If you go back to Sammy in high school, again, I'm not perfect. There's so many things that I've gotten better at. I probably wouldn't go to that one scenario and jot out everything that was on my heart because I was so bothered and I had an image issue and I had a pride issue and it wasn't filled with humility. I wanted people to know I'm good. I'm better than you. I'll top you. So let's like have a conversation, but not just you and I face to face in front of everyone in the high school. And I'll never forget if I could go back, I realized from moments like that, what it created was a harboring effect in my heart and it created so much disorder. Think of it like this. God creates order. He's brought order to our life. He brings order through the Spirit. We're going to talk about the different uh, correlations of the Spirit. He brings order, peace. He brings order, wisdom. He brings order. And what the enemy desires to do, why James brings up this demonic perspective of ways, is the enemy wants to take order and make it filled with disorder. That's his main goal. He wants to bring what God has brought as order in our life and just mess it all up. And how he does that is he gets at your pride, he gets at your envy, he gets at self-ambition, which all really will come out of your mouth eventually. And like I said, let's not like get it up confused. Really, what's coming out of your mouth is a direct correlation to what's already in your heart. And that's something that James is saying, you got to deal with. This is a learning curve for us. So if we focus about words or about bad deeds or about self-ambition or on pride or our evil, we are missing the point. Again, it's the heart, the matter of the heart. So the text, the, the text keeps unfolding. James 4 verses 1 through 3 says this. Now he's going on. Like if you were to just pick up your Bible and look at chapter 3, read it, and you'll see it just, it speaks for itself right into chapter 4. He says this. What then causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desire, your self-ambition, your envy, all of this type of, don't they come from that, that battles within you? You desire, but you don't have. So you kill, you covet, but you can't get what you want. So you quarrel and you fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasure. So here's what James is trying to say to us, which if I'm being honest, was incredibly convicting, but I think it's in a good way. We wanna get better, we wanna be called to more, and James is calling me out. He's saying, hey, Sammy, here's the deal. Yes, you have a relationship with Jesus, and that's amazing, but if we're gonna go deeper, let's, let's examine your heart, let's put it on display, let's, let's look at it and see what it is. What are the words that are coming out of your mouth? What are the things that you're thinking You're so, you want that big house, you want that nice car, you want what other people don't have. And now you have this harboring effect of self-ambition, of envy, and really it's a direct correlation to your heart. And it's this desire thing, this desire thing, this desire thing. And you're crying out to God, God, I want that house. God, I want that car. God, I want whatever it is. And he's saying, I see that you want it, but it comes out of pleasure. It comes because you want people to see how good you're doing. You want people to see how amazing you are. And now it's a self-image thing. And again, it trickles down to pride, not humility. So here is the solution. There is a solution to all of this. It's not, and and, and check this out, I'm a preacher right now. I wish I could actually like get on my knees and run around a little bit or like get up on the stage, but I wanna express it to you. Here's the solution. It's not just to zip our lips it's to bend our knees. So you want the solution to self-ambition, to envy, you want the solution to where like, what's wrong with the words that are coming out of your mouth, how it could either be good or bad or destructive or not. The solution is humility. When we bend our knee to the creator of the universe, what we're saying is we're creating a posture of, hey God, it's yours. It's yours to begin with. I really don't need much more. I have enough. Jesus, you are not just savior of my life. You saved me from all of my mess up. That high school Sammy, you saved me from. That like bickering Sammy, you saved me from. That mess up Sammy, you saved me from. And so Jesus, I I surrender to you. You are my Lord. You're not just, yes, you're my savior, but you're my Lord. Because you're my Lord, I'm gonna bend my knee to you. I'm gonna say I surrender all of it. That's the solution and it goes back to humility. If you're not willing to bend your knee to a king, I would argue you have no humility in your bones because it takes 
a, a true self to just say, hey, it's not me, it's you, God. You can have it, I don't need it. It's not about pleasures, it's just about what you wanna do in my life. And I believe that's when God begins to do a work. And again, this is a growing process. I'm still working this, you're still working this. I don't think we will fully reach this until we find true sanctification or do we, we just find ourselves in heaven. But during this lifespan of, of our journey, we have to get to a point because we're gonna get messed up along the whole journey if we have this part wrong. It's bending my knee, not just zipping my, my mouth, because when you bend your knee in humility, God begins to do a work in your heart. One of the most straightforward punches to the face in the book in its entirety, I would argue, comes right now in this next verse in chapter four. James literally punches us right in the nose where our vision gets impaired, where like our eyes start to water up. And to me, I love it. I'm like, dang, I, I really like, I needed to hear it and it sucks and like that hurt, but man, this is really gonna help me grow. This is calling me to more. James says this in James four, verses four through six. He says this, you adulterous people, like you wicked, evil, adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world, pride, envy, self-ambition, the way that you're talking, the way you're holding yourself, do you not know that friendship with the world means enmity against God. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. That like hurts, if I'm being honest. Like why, you're calling me, you're telling me I'm an adulterous person? Like what are you talking about? And then he goes on in verse five, he says, do you think the scripture says without reason that he, Jesus, God, our King, jealously longs for the spirit the spirit he caused to dwell in us. So now there's this war taking place in our soul, in our heart. It's the spirit of God and it's the spirit of the world, right? Unearthly stuff, unspiritual stuff, disorder, demonic perspectives, all comes from the world spirit compared to the spirit of God. And then he says this, which I love, verse six, but he gives us more grace. Thank God, I need grace. That high school Sammy, that like 26, 27 year old, 30 year old, 35, 45 uh, on, like that Sammy, you, we all need the grace because we're gonna mess up, we're gonna fall short. That grace, he gives us more. And the scripture says this, God opposes the proud, like, he's like, dude, I, I cannot help you so much. Like, you, it's kind of like thus far no further because you've got so much pride built up. Look at the way you're speaking to other people. Look at the way people are examining you. Now we're making false witness about God because of the, the tongue that is, the words that are coming out of our mouth. Now it shows our heart. And God says, I oppose the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. And that's good news for those that are willing to bend their knee. That's really good news because God will lift those up in his time. If he's savior, I don't care when he lifts me up. I don't care when he gives me a platform. I don't care when he helps me. I don't care when he comes through for me because at the end of the day, if God really is sovereign, if God really is king, then I'm okay with it. I don't need anything more. I don't need to add to God. But James is saying for the people in this church, for the people that are believing this way, you're adulterous. And he goes on, and the reason why I bring that up is because it's kind of like a hit on us, right? See, God has grace for us. That's, that's amazing. We need that. And he will, he will make a difference in our life with the Spirit, with the Spirit, with the Spirit. And here's what the Spirit says. If we go to talk, have now a conversation with Paul, which remember, James and Paul were friends. James and Paul had it going on. James and Paul knew they were in correlation with each other. They, they encouraged each other. James was a leader in the church in Jerusalem. He was a leader. He was writing to these, these people. And, and now Paul is a missionary, but Paul and James, they, 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 they go hand in hand. Paul says this in Galatians 5, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, I'm going there. Debauchery, Paul says idolatry and witchcraft. That it's all flesh. That's all obvious stuff of this world. Hatred, discord, here's our contender, jealousy. Fits of rage, here's contender number two, self-ambition. Dissensions which lead to factions, and again, here's contender number three, and envy. And then he goes on to say, but I got good news. The spirit is this. The spirit is love, the spirit is joy, it's peace, it's forbearance, it's kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and here's our main point, self-control. So Paul then, 
is having a conversation with James. Paul gives the answer to James because James asks this question. He says, who can tame the tongue? Paul answers and says this, the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of God that can kind of fix things, bring things together. It's the Spirit of God that can move in your life. And if you allow with a bent knee for God to be sovereign in your life, then God can do the greatest work in your heart. And it really starts with your heart and eventually it's going to come out of your mouth. And it all correlates back to envy, self-ambition, worldly practices, and all of that's just disorder. If you saw Sammy in high school, again, I'm not perfect, I'm growing, but if you were to go to Sammy in high school, everywhere I went, there was disorder. There was frustration, there was drama, there were issues, I was getting in fights, people didn't like me, the girls didn't like me, the guys didn't like me, I was like this punk guy that had so much pride, and the problem was, it wasn't filled with, with order from God. It wasn't filled with these things, the gifts of the Spirit, it was filled with complete contrary disorder. Some of these things that, that the flesh points out was things that I was actually participating in and God had to do a deep work, not just in my lips. He had to first see that I was gonna humble myself and then he could say, I, I can work with this now. So why adulterous people? It's the question of the heart. And here's a question for you. Is God enough for you? Like, is he really enough for you? Because that's what James is saying. He's saying, you're adulterous. Like, you're cheating on God. You're cheating with this world. And he says, James is saying, you want to be the bride of Christ because that's what we're considered. Again, here's the meat, not the milk. Like, it, it, we're beyond the milk right now. Like, this is like really dense stuff. We kind of have to process this. Our bodies have to digest. Our spirit has to digest this. It's not just easy just to drink. We have to chew it. We have to be proportionate about it. But I'm giving you the meat right now. We are considered the bride of Christ. For anyone that calls himself a Christian, servant of Jesus, an apprentice of Jesus, you are considered the bride. The brides are beautiful, brides are amazing. The husband, the groom is waiting for his bride to come on in. Everyone, all eyes are on the bride. And James is saying, you're adulterous because it looks like you're dating the world. You're not really dating what you're supposed to. You're not really pursuing what you're supposed to. You're now in this adulterous relationship with the world and with the spirit. It looks like you know you're chosen. Here, here it is, like I know I'm chosen. I know I'm adopted, I know I'm filled, I know I'm saved, I know I'm a son or a daughter, I know I'm an heir to God and I'm an, a co-heir to Christ. But it looks like we're getting a lot of self-worth from here it is, here's the self aim for, for money, the money you have or what your friends say or where you live or the size of your biceps <laughs> or the position in your company or the title that you have, here it is, we're dating the world if we participate in such things. And again, this is like straightforward. Like James is not holding back any punches. He's now socked me in the face multiple times with this. He asked this, I'll ask it again. Is God enough for you? Is God enough? If he is enough, you'll begin to have this attitude, submission and humility. And that's what we find in James chapter four. This word, these two words come up over and over, submission and humility. I'm bending my knees to the creator of the universe and God shows then favor to the humble. So how do we apply this? How do we practice this? Here it is, the Spirit will lead us to speak what is true with love and, with ne and when necessary. With love, speak what is true when necessary. Like we don't always have to be saying something. So write this down if you're taking notes. One, if you're going to speak, always ask yourself, is it true, is it necessary, and is it kind? I'll say it again for the people in the back. Is it true? Is it necessary and is it kind? Paul said this, here's Paul's correlation, Ephesians 4. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, the one who's trying to give us self-control and, and tame our tongue. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. How do we apply this? Here's another one. If you're struggling with jealousy of others, celebrate other people publicly. Here's an encouragement for you. If you got jealousy in your heart, that's gonna corrode your soul and it's eventually gonna come out of your mouth. It's gonna come out of your lips. Your relationships are gonna get messed up. You're gonna be so worried about other people. Maybe you're in a relationship right now and all you are just jealous and there's a problem and it goes back to your heart. If you have jealousy issues, maybe you're like me and you see other social media platforms and you're like, man, that church is doing so much better than me and there's this jealousy that builds up. Here, here are some practical tools. Celebrate people publicly. 
If we have social media, use it. Find a way to celebrate those that are doing amazing in your life. Celebrate your boss. Celebrate your peers. Celebrate some random person who did an act of kindness. And we can exercise the muscle to fight against jealousy. Here's another practical way. And write this down if you're taking notes. Seek and make it your ambition to say less and not more. This one's for me. My goodness. Say less and not more. You see, I've learned and noticed some of my favorite mentors, those, those, those gurus in my life. When I'm sitting there and I'm like talking, I'm just like, like shouting everything and like, I'm like sweating because I have to get across what I need to get across because I need that like word of knowledge and that encouragement. And like my, my mentors are just like people that are just really in tune with God. I call them the gray hairs of my life and they just sit back and they say very little. They just listen. Very little. They just listen. I've realized that those are the type of people that I look up to and they say less. You see, words are so powerful. Here's another one, here's a quote. This one hit me again, I hope it hits you. Maturity is realizing how many things don't require your comment. Say it again. Maturity is realizing, like if you wanna be mature, if you want the meat, if you want to understand the scripture, if you wanna be led by the spirit, then just take this for what it is. Maturity is realizing how many things don't require your comment. Here's my last practical note. Proverbs says this, I say this often because this is really a word of encouragement for me. It's kind of like a scripture that's tattooed on my heart. Proverbs 18, 21 says this, the power of life and death is in the tongue. It's small, it's, it's tiny, but yet its power is titanic and it can detour your life, it can jack up your life, it can get you into doors that you've never been in by God's favor, but it really starts, it starts with humility. So there's, there's beauty in, the, in our future for everyone here that's listening to me, for you, for me, there's beauty, there's wonder, there's, there's favor, there's amazing things on the other side of this craziness we're going through, especially because we will pursue love and pursue life. And really, we gotta pursue Jesus. So we get to speak into our future. We get, we get under the mighty hand of God and say like, you know what, I'm not, again, here, here's the power of your word. I'm not sure how this COVID-19 is going to work out, but God is going to come through. I'm not worried about what's gonna happen. I might be a little scared. I might be a little flustered. I might be a little, I don't know if I should give you a hug, but regardless, at the end of the day, God's gonna see us through it. God's gonna take care of us. I choose to speak life because life really comes in the power of the tongue. Wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, whatever you're going through in your life, I want you to know God's gonna come through for you and your home. It starts with eating this up, and yeah, it's some milk at first, but really, if we're gonna go deep into this, pick up the book of James, read chapter three, read chapter four, and realize the words we speak will detour our future, will help our future or destroy our future. I hope this encourages you. I love you so much. We will see you next time. Hey guys, let me finish this off with with some prayer for you. God, I pray for every person on the other side of this camera. God, that are watching in their living rooms with their family, with their friends, that are listening on the podcast as they drive to work. God, wherever they find themselves, I pray that you would encourage them on the, the, the power of the book of James, Father, that this is a direct correlation and hit to our heart, Father. It's a heart issue, and I pray that we would struggle with this, that we, we would wrestle with this, but ultimately, at the end of the day, that we would humble ourselves, that we wouldn't be so focused on self-ambition or envy, but God, we would give it to you. We would ask ask you to humble ourselves. We would bend our knee to you. And at the end of the day, God, you're going to raise us up. You're going to show us favor and you're going to see us through. We love you so much, God. And we pray these things in your name. We pray. Amen.